This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Today I am doing something new with a telephoto lens from Sigma. This is the Sigma 150 to 600 DGDNOS. I hope I memorized that correctly. And it comes in a massive, this is the biggest box I've ever received from Sigma. Now, what's more impressive than the box is that when you mount this lens on an APS-C censored camera, such as my A6100, it becomes effectively 900 millimeters, which is nuts. Anyway, let's get started by seeing how this thing comes packaged. So here is the giant box again, and inside there is a huge carrying case for this lens. Inside the zippered case is the lens itself, an extra strap, a giant plastic lens cap, and some Allen wrenches. And then you also get the standard Sigma reading materials. Now this lens is a beast. It's long, it's heavy, and it's big. It weighs 2 kilos, 240 grams, or just about 5 pounds. Around the rear there is a plastic lens cap, and the front has a nice padded alternative lens cover that I prefer over the plastic lens cap. The lens hood is here, it's big, made out of plastic, and I like the way that it attaches to the body of the lens with a thumb screw. Starting at the rear, there is a metal mount with electronic connections as well as a rubber gasket for weather sealing. This lens is dust and splash resistant according to Sigma with seals at the focus and zoom rings and at the ports. Towards the back, there is some lens specs, a ton of switches here, autofocus to manual focus switch, a focus limiter switch, optical stabilization setting 1, 2 or off, and custom C1, C2 or off. Because this is a heavy lens, there is a removable tripod mount that is an Arca Swiss plate so you can put this lens on a tripod and mount your camera to it. It's really too big to do the other way around. Minimum focus distances are nice and close for macro type work and this lens is made in Japan. In front of the manual focus ring there is another switch LTS which stands for lock tight and smooth as far as I can tell. L locks the zoom ring in place in case you are traveling and packing this lens away. T creates some tension in the zoom ring so it will not creep on you when face down, but it does increase resistance so it slows you down a little bit if you're trying to zoom quickly in or out. And S is the usual light, fast, easy zoom ring that we know which makes the lens creep like crazy. So for the most part, I left this lens in T for all of my sample work. Now the zoom ring extends this lens quite a bit Bit, but it is very smooth, very well done, and you can either rotate the zoom ring or just pull the front of the lens forward or back to control the zoom. There are a couple of custom buttons located here, a little sports S logo as well. And then we come to the front lens element, which is a massive piece of glass. Inside there are 24 elements in 16 groups and a nine rounded blade diaphragm. On my A7C, this lens looks massive and it is, especially with the lens hood attached and especially zoomed in all the way to 600 millimeters. This is not a lens you can walk around with discreetly. It will attract attention and comments, but the design is great. The build is excellent. It feels like a very well-built lens the best telephoto lens that I've handled on this channel by far. So what I wanted to do was try my hand at bird photography with this lens. So what I did is I took a class on Skillshare, which happens to be the sponsor of this video. For those who don't know, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of online classes and members across 150 countries. It's a place to get inspired, learn new skills, and put them to work. You can invest in yourself and your personal growth. For me, I had a specific skill that I was trying to learn, which is bird photography, but Skillshare offers classes in a wide variety of different topics, including illustration, graphic design, freelancing, videography, and more. So I found this class titled Photographing the Beauty of Birds, taught by Prashat Gupta. And let me just say this was a very concise, complete overview of photography. He walked through cameras, lenses, exposure, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, bokeh, and there were a bunch of practical techniques at the end. As to whether or not I became a better bird photographer, you'll have to wait till later in this video. Skillshare is completely ad-free and with new premium classes that are launched each week, there is always something to learn. And because they are sponsoring this video, the first 1,000 people to use the link down in the description below or my code ARTHURR0522 will get a free one month trial of Skillshare. So please check that out in the description below. Special thank you to Skillshare for being a continued sponsor 
of this channel. All right, so let's take a look at some sample photos with this lens. Uh, what I did is I took it out with my uh, a7C as well as my a6100. I probably shot more samples with the a6100 just because zooming into 900 millimeters equivalent was a lot of fun. Uh, and bear in mind that I am by no means an expert in telephoto photography, uh, but here you go. Ready, set, go. <laughs> Okay, I'll just say this about bird photography. Uh, it was very peaceful. I went out actually this morning uh, out in nature and I walked around for a couple of hours uh, trying to find birds. And it's hard to do because they are very sneaky. They fly very quickly. I had a couple of opportunities, uh, actually just one, maybe two opportunities where I zoomed in and I was close, but it's hard to locate your subject when you are zoomed into 600 millimeters. That's what I learned. It's like you put your camera and the lens up and you think it's there, but you're completely off. And so that was a little bit of a learning curve. I have a newfound respect for bird photography in general. Uh, number one, for your patience, for going out and trying to find a bird to photograph. And number two, for the strength that it takes to carry around a five pound plus uh, camera and lens combination because it is tiring after a little bit. Now this lens performed flawlessly. Optically, it gives you sharp results wide open in the center of the frame and in the corners. This isn't an f2.8 lens, it's variable aperture zoom, so it's not the brightest for low light work, but for doing this, in the sunshine, it was perfect. I never found myself wanting more than f5 at these crazy zoomed in focal lengths. The depth of field and the subject separation is excellent. I snapped a few photos of the drone that I was reviewing recently and there's really nothing to complain about here. I would describe the center sharpness as excellent and the corner sharpness as excellent as well. It's a very flat focusing lens, which is something that I like. The colors are vibrant, contrast is nice and strong. Distortion overall is very minimal. Even chromatic aberration, which I'm used to seeing on every single lens that I review, is well controlled here with this lens. Flare control is excellent as well with the included lens hood. And then I have to talk about this, which is OS or optical stabilization, because it is a lot better than I expected it to be. Now, when I took this lens out with me, every single place that I went, I had a tripod in the trunk of my car but it stayed there. I never once took out my tripod, so all of those samples that you saw were handheld. Everything that you're seeing is shot handheld, which is truly impressive. When you press the shutter halfway down, it completely changes what you are seeing through the viewfinder. It becomes impressively stable. It looks like you've just mounted this camera and lens on a tripod. I shot this lens with my a6100 for the sole purpose of seeing how it acted uh, without a camera with in-body image stabilization. And again, the results speak for themselves. With most full frame cameras, every single full frame Sony mirrorless camera now has in-body image stabilization. So when you combine that with optical stabilization, you get impressive results even way out at 600 
millimeters. This lens has an incredible minimum focus distance of less than two feet, so you can capture some nice flowers up close and look at how smooth the bokeh rendering is with this Sigma. In terms of autofocus, it was quick, it was silent, and it was accurate. There were a few examples in my photos with tough lighting where the focus didn't land perfectly, but those were few and far between. When you think about the focal length and the range of focus at, let's say, 600 millimeters, for this lens to do what it does, and lock onto a plane like this is impressive. In researching this lens, I've come across a few mentions that the autofocus system in this lens, while fast and silent, doesn't keep up with the autofocus of the native Sony 200-600 in burst mode, and that may be the case, but I've never handled the Sony 200-600. All I will say is that for the type of shooting I was doing, it performed exceptionally well, and there were only four or five times total where it wasn't doing exactly what I wanted it to. For photographing people, I autofocus worked impressively well with my a7C and my a6600, uh, even way out at 600 millimeters. It was crazy to see that little green box lock onto someone's eye as they're walking at 600 millimeters. The closest competitor to this lens besides the more expensive Sony 200-600 is the Tamron 150-500, which I reviewed in June of last year. And the Tamron is an excellent lens as well. It is a little bit lighter, but it doesn't go to 600 millimeters like this Sigma does. The vibration control on the Tamron, while good, doesn't seem to be as stable as the optical stabilization on this lens, but optically they are about neck and neck in terms of sharpness in the center and in the corners. It is hard to pick out a winner between those two lenses. To top it off, they are priced exactly the same as well. I think right now in the variable aperture telephoto lens lineup, there are three strong contenders this Sigma, the Tamron, and the Sony. Now the Sony has the advantage of slightly better autofocus in burst mode from what I read, and it has the advantage of teleconverters that work with Sony camera bodies, and it's also a cool white lens body, but it is $2,000, however, which is $600 more than either the Sigma and the Tamron, and both of those are just as fully featured as the Sony. If it were my money, I would be choosing between this Sigma and the Tamron, and and you really can't go wrong with either one and both have kind of their trade-offs. The Tamron is lighter, it's a little bit smaller, the Sigma gives you an extra 100 millimeters on the telephoto end to 600 millimeters, optical stabilization is a little bit better with the Sigma, and I'd say that the build quality is just a touch better with the Sigma as well. Uh, so those are things to consider, but again, both lenses perform excellent and I think both are better value than getting the Sony unless you are planning on using a teleconverter or planning on shooting a super high burst rate or you have a camera such as the A1 in which case you can shoot at 30 frames per second or something crazy like that. Anyway, that is going to be it for my review of this Sigma. I hope you guys enjoyed it and you enjoyed watching me struggle and uh, fail at bird photography. Uh, it certainly has been fun using this lens. Unfortunately, I do have to send it back to Sigma, but not before I go out and try some more bird photography over the next couple of days. Let me know what your favorite variable aperture lens is from the three that I talked about in this video. And stay tuned for more. I have a lot of videos coming out this month, so please subscribe if you have not subscribed already. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks so much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.